Everyone had a job when the dam was on. I'll just talk about my very brief memories of Barumba Dam. I'm also patron with the Lake Barumba fish stocking group. When the dam gets really low, you can see all the old cattle yards. His parents were among the first to water ski on the dam. Yeah, well, that inlet tower lets the water through when the flood's on. I'm also patron with the Lake Barumba fish stocking group, which used to be called the Lake Barumba Family Fishing Classic. And we started that off to create interest for tourism in, in the Mary Valley. The fish stocking group actually get funding from council, state government, other bodies to put fish into the lake, which is great for tourism, tourism being my portfolio when I was on council. And it's wonderful to go out on the boat. There's photos that I've supplied out on the boat with the fingerlings, tipping the fingerlings into the water. It's such a buzz to know that those fingerlings like this big are going to be this big and somebody's going to actually catch it. They have tag fish competitions. They have catch and release. Uh, Saratogas and so on are uh, catch and release. So that is really, yeah, it's fun and it's so wonderful for tourism. I love it. And <laughs> It's really good. So, yeah, uh, there's so much to tell. Um, so I met my husband water skiing at Barumba Dam and it was, um, that was something he had done forever. Um, his parents have told me he was five or six when he got on skis. His, the dam was built in 64, so that's when Blair was born, but his parents were among the first to water ski on the dam. Um, so as local business people, they were involved in the camp and the building of it. And then they went on to use it recreationally. And of course, it's an irrigation supply, so it's a very important um, piece of infrastructure for the valley but we used to water ski every weekend and I'm not elegant but I can do it <laughs> and we have many stories of camping up there on the weekend um, at the time I met Blair there was a water skiing association and they um, put on a show when I first met him and did the tower with three skiers, two skiers, one skier, that kind of thing. So and that was all, you know, to be involved in that is just fun. And when you're early adulthood, you're just going out, you've got fast boats, you've got fit people and you just have a whale of a time. It's I've actually got a photograph of three of the guys um, barefooting on the dam, so three up behind the boat, which is stunning to watch. And they all wish they could do it now. They're all a bit older now. But a lot skiing has gone more to wakeboarding, so you don't see a lot of skiers and barefooters in our region anymore. And I think that's a bit of a shame, but it's a great day out. Mum used to go deliver groceries on horseback and she used to ride right up past where the dam is now um, and there was there was a family lived up where the dam is I'd, I'd say it was swamped when the dam was built and she told me that the kids had never been to school that's that's all I know about that um, probably well I've never seen it but when the dam gets really low you can see all the old cattle yards oh, wow. that were there originally, yeah. Everyone had a job when the dam was on. There was people who left jobs to go and work at the dam because there's a few extra dollars up there. And um, the, the dam was a big employer for a few years while it was there. Uh, and then the forestry, it was a big employer, but that has all changed now. They've deregulated and whatever. But um, yeah, the, the workforce in the valley has changed a heck of a lot over the last 50 years, 60 years. Mm -hmm. okay. That's right, you went where the work was and like um, there was even pineapple farmers that just virtually shut down their farms, the smaller ones, and went and worked at the dam for a few years to make a few dollars, then they came back to their pineapple farms. And uh, yeah, there was things like that happen. Then left the sawmills to go to the, to the Dam and I'll just talk about my very brief memories of Barumba Dam. Around the, the very, it would be the very early 1960s, I think, um, Barumba Dam started to be built. Again, I can't remember anything about the, the background of it and the back chatter at all. And of course, there was an influx of workers to the Merry Valley, and then a lot of people in the, the Merry Valley townships went to work there as well. Uh, the bit I recall specifically 
is um, there are a lot of mid-European and northern European people came, um, which was interesting in that they looked different from us because most of us had, you know, a lot of us had Irish backgrounds and English backgrounds, a lot of us had were dark haired and whatever, and they were beautiful, beautiful white skin, white hair. Um, and some of them had their families with them. Not all of them did, but some of them. And I suspect those families had followed them around the construction that had occurred post-war because the snowy mountains things had started to develop and there were a number of dams being built around the east coast, you know, eastern part of Australia. Um, and I guess they didn't want to live in the vans and, and the, the dongers up there. And they found houses in the, the townships. And one particular family I remember were from Norway and they lived in Abermore Township, just um, a street down from the school. And one of the daughters, they had four children, I think, one of the daughters was in my class. And we were all pretty fascinated by Anne because she was had the beautiful straight white blonde hair. She spoke very good English, but with a very crisp accent. So I would say they had been around various places in Australia. And she wasn't much bothered about being early for school or missing school. You know, that was sort of important to all of us in those days. And I think it was because of the life, you know, the interesting lifestyle they'd lived. Um, and the other thing was in wintertime, she always came with her beautiful sweaters, you know, with with the patterns on them, and I always remember that, um, which her mother would have knitted. And I remember that they went backwards and forwards to Norway over the years, I don't know how many years, it was probably three or four, they lived in that house. Um, but they, members of the family did go backwards and forwards. And I have um, an inkling that, there, that a grandma came out at, at one stage too, to stay there. So that sort of in a way opened up the world for a lot of us to think, well, okay, all these people live on the other side of the world and they, they come to places like the Mary Valley. And so that's the aspect I remember. Um, another thing was that came became a bit of a tourist attraction, I suppose, in a way, and odd weekends, uh, Dad had, you know, we'd drive up and have a look at the progress and I remember all the vans all lined up, which we couldn't quite believe that all that, that beautiful ground was all covered with all of this. But um, yeah, so that, they're my small memories of Barumba Dam. I don't know where they went, but one of the, the elder sisters, she stayed and I think she married someone in the community. I don't know what happened there. But I did see Anne a few years later, wouldn't have been too many years later, on a New Year's Eve out, I was out at the Jockey Club with my sister and her husband and, and some other people, and I saw her in the distance right over the room, but I didn't ever get a, a chance to speak to her. So I suspect they kept on doing the same thing, was coming backwards and forwards to, to link up with their family again. Yeah. yeah, it was lovely. It's a lovely memory. Yeah, Val, my wife, she was a nursing sister. She'd done a lot of nurse. I was, I was the ambulance driver too for 18 months. I used to drive the ambulance chair. Yeah. And uh, then when I left the shop, oh, I used to bring the paymaster in to collect the money or take all the big bosses to Brisbane. I had a cushy job there for a while, yeah. That sort of thing, yeah. Yep. Then when that finished, I went to Adelaide with the same company. Seven till I was, 1966 I left there, went north. Yeah. 1966, yeah. yeah. I, did, oh, I used to do all the postal work, yeah. And a fellow called Michael Basodi, he got electrocuted up there today. The He's leaning on a machine and the steel tracks that went through him. And uh, Val went up too to see him there. Just purple he was, he just cooked. So I had to sort all these money out for overseas and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Just the one building, it was yeah. a bank. And they had the outside phone, you had to control it. All the calls and all that sort of thing, yeah. And Melbourne Cup Day, should be in jail, shouldn't I? Clary King was the SP bookie in the camp, and the ladies come with their money and their name and all that on over the post office counter, and I'd give it to Clary. You wouldn't do it now, would you? Yeah, when I worked in the post office store at Brumba there, I used to handle the store and everything. Then in the post office, I'd uh, handle the money, 
for all sorts of things in the post office and all the, the phone money. The outside had to go on the bin, you had to check all the phone money every time and you had to write all that down to the last cent and all that sort of thing, yeah. If you go to Brumba Dam, you know, just a little bit north, a few hundred metres, you see that little tower sticking out the ground there. Well, I used to sit on top of that and winch all the material down with it working all the bottom. Sit on top of that, yeah. And all the pipes underneath, big pipes are going to the dam and let the water go through. We had scaffolding, we made scaffolding with all the shape of the pipe and all that. And we'd winch all the pipes up, undo the scaffolding and drop on the pedestals. And that's how we took all those pipes underneath, yeah. Yeah, well, that inlet tower lets the water through when the flood's on and lets the water run right through the pipes. So I sat up there with an air winch and I winched all the material up and down with an air winch there to do that. Then with the pipes, we had an air winch in the bottom. We used to get the scaffolding, put the pipes on, pull the pipes up, then knock the scaffolding down, let the pipes fall on the pedestals. Yeah. At that stage, they had ladders going up and there wasn't much water there at all. We got up with the ladders at the top. But it's only to let the up and down, let the water through. Place in the rock here. Yep. We used to have big monitors, like the you know the fire brigade used the big water pressure. Yeah. Oh. And I know one fellow hit in the leg and smashed his leg. That's much how pressure was on oh it my there. Gosh. Yeah. Probably a third away through. Okay. But now all had happened. Yeah. They had a bio wash on, on the other side. Yep. They let the water run through the one side while they built this. Okay. Then they blocked that off later on. Okay. Yeah. Because Bella Creek comes in down further. Yeah. And the quarry is right behind you up in the hill there. Hang on. That was a quarry. Yeah. Just down here near that flat place down here, that's where the crushing plant was for the rock to make the concrete. Yep. That, that was down here. That's where Michael Brazzotti got killed, executed on the crane, yeah. Exciting, and where them sheds are down there now, more or less, that's where the workshop was at store and that. And Citra had their offices back over towards the water on the, okay. on the bottom there. Then once you cross that creek going back, that's where the houses and all the camps were. And, all that down further. Actually, when they were blowing here once up the rock here, one of the houses right down further put a stone right through the roof of one of the French quarters. But we were going through yesterday, there must be at least 50 married demandables there. I'll say at least 50. And there's one, two, six, six houses up the top and about nine houses. And about 60 men in the single quarters, I suppose, roughly. So it was a fairly big concern. Yes, so I used to live here, yeah, with a wife and two children. I was with Val's parents in the shop at Imble. Yeah. And I come out here to run the post office and the store, 1960. Really? Bought one out and had another one while I was here. Okay. <laughs> no, no TV then. Yeah. Had two boys. Two boys. Mike was about 12 months, was he or not? Really? Ian was born here. Yeah. Most of the camp was all done before people shifted in. Nearly all of them. Yeah, even the single man's quarters used to be up there, on there. Don't no, no, let you all, all done first, yeah. If you start from the bottom end down there, there's about three small houses down past that building. And some of the bosses for Citra, the firm here, used to live there. There's about three houses, this one down there. On your left, where that van is there now, over here, the school. Straight over your head with that tarps on the ground. That was the school area there. And this side of those blue uh, toilets there thing, this side, that's where the shop was. And where the toilet is on the other side is where the staff barracks were for the staff men. Right up across the road, up where all of the trees are, that's where the single quarters were, all the single men. They had a big mess there and all that for them. And the canteen was just above us up there. Just before you turned down this road, that was a canteen there. Wet canteen, yeah. That's for anybody, even, oh, okay. even me and I was married. Just beside the road where that, where that rise is, yeah. just on there, that was a canteen. Yeah, okay. Run by the Irrigation Water Supply, IWS then, yeah. yeah. There's three rows three of dongas. One, two, three, yeah. yeah. But dongas, I don't know how many it was altogether. There's about eight between here and the next street, so there'll be eight, sixteen. There's about 22. Must have been 50 dongas here anyway, at least. Yeah. yeah. And, and on the other end, there was staff houses. There's 
three that on facing that way for the Frenchman, and three this way. It was Brophy's, Jack Lyons, and someone else on that side, wasn't it? Yeah. People live behind us just here. What was his name? Uh, Charlie Lund, wasn't it? Yes. He lived there. He got killed in the Gateway Bridge in Melbourne, wasn't that the Gateway in Melbourne or something? The bridge collapsed? Westgate. Westgate. He had the donga here and had a little, could drive the car there. I had a shade up for the car just there. Yeah, there was still a bit of a road here. It wasn't flat on the ground. It was about three steps up. Yeah, a little bit off the ground, yeah. So you, you, had, you walked up the central steps and you, when you, you just walked into, and it was open plan because you had, you lived there, you ate there. It was your kitchen come living area. On one end there was a bedroom and on the other end there was another bedroom. And the back door where we were was through our bedroom. And that just took me straight out into the laundry area and the, and the yard. And the toilet and the shower and all out and the back. Yeah. Well, it was an outdoor loo, so it was up that way a bit. Too. Proper sewage, like sewage. they had a sewage right plant right here and all that. And also the fireplace was, um, you know, the old fireplace, which was extended out. We had a, a crown wood stove. With a fountain on the a side. Fountain on the side, and that was our hot water on yeah. the stove. Mm. And also that was our heat in the winter. Believe you me, it used to get cold here. Yeah. Really very, very hot in the summer. And the old light switches that weren't pressed ones, you had a cord coming down, you had to pull the cord. I had a couple of beers one night and I come home, put the light on and went to pull the cord. It was a fly sticker, one of them fly stickers. I finished <laughs> up with <laughs> fly sticker all over me. Yeah, but no, no fly screens, so. Oh, we used to line our doggers with sizal craft yeah. to keep the heat out. Then in the summertime, you put your hose, you just sprinkle on top of the roof and over the top of the roof. You had a copper in the backyard, you used to boil the copper hot water and cook your ham in and no hot water on the showers you used to have a copper pipe and put cotton wool and metho in it and burn that warm it up. to warm, warm the water up yeah. i'm just looking at that tree there yeah. and i reckon that tree was there but not as big as that where keith had the put up the like a, a shelter for the car mm. there, there, that was in between trees mm. would you reckon those trees were there too They'd have to be there because they're still there. But it couldn't have been there because Charlie Lund lived there. How did he get? It wasn't as overgrown as this. No. Nowhere near it. Because we're going back a fair way, eh? Yeah. 60 odd years, so the trees were a good lot smaller anyway. There's nothing like this.